Well, hey, it's Dr. Pompey here, and not live. We're actually recording this call because we are shooting, actually, Phil and I, some amazing shows that you're going to see in the future. But uh, we are recording this show. But uh, I have Phil here, which some of you watched many of the past shows, actually know who this gentleman is. And it's nice to see you again. Yeah. Well, I, I have to always joke ab about this because I always say my interest in nutrition actually started back when I was a wrestler trying to make sure I just didn't lose weight the bad way where you, you know, see people cutting calories right and they're trying to get skinny to make a weight. And I said, you know, I'm just not going to do that because I, I saw those guys lose strength, right? It's like I'm not just going to cut a weight class. So I, I really had no nutrition source except muscle and fitness. You know, it's like, gosh, these guys are fit, right? So, you know, I got muscle and fitness. I even got a subscription. And I started reading all the articles in Muscle and Fitness. What I didn't know at that time is most likely I was reading this guy's articles. Mm. Yes, he was good friends with Joe Weider at that time. And you not only wrote most of the articles for Muscle and Fitness, you wrote Flex Magazine. I mean, all the magazines that I read as a kid. Am I right on that? Yes. And in fact, Joe Weider said, let's write some good articles because Dr. Papa is going to be reading them. <laughs> and he's going to become very famous one. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. So anyways, but Phil actually had what, the largest uh, fitness radio show. Um, and as a matter of fact, guys, I have to say this, but we're doing a, a radio show together. And he had the largest fitness radio show in the country. And um, Phil was, I would say, the most famous guy in fitness. Okay. So, so enough about I'm that. I'm a pro. Let's just but keep no, talking no, about let's, you. Let's, talk let's keep about talking about you. We have something <laughs> okay. to talk about. Mold. Mold is the topic yeah. today. Yeah, mold is the topic today. I, I actually announced it last week, and um, I said this is one of these big ones that we need to discuss. Last week we discussed Lyme. Uh, you know, and I, I say and I'll repeat, there's the big three amigos, right? You know, we can't get rid of all the chemicals in our life. However, when we get hit with heavy metals, when we get hit with infections like Lyme, even infections from root canals, cavitations, and we get hit with biotoxins from mold, these things shut down detox pathways. They have such a dramatic effect on the nerve system that literally now we become very sensitive to every toxin. And, you know, I... I just heavy recently, metals, line, heavy and metals. Line. We'll say heavy metals infection because infection puts out a biotoxin. That's a sure. toxin produced by a living thing. So root canals, cavitations. You know, I always say, and you probably have heard me say to the doctors, if someone's not getting well, there's still something upstream. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had that happen to a client probably two weeks ago. They weren't getting well. They weren't getting well. She had a, a root canal that was under a crowd. She didn't know it was there. Uh, she got it out, and since then, I've been getting emails. Better and better. And better and better and better, exactly. She's like, her sensitivities went down. Even her food sensitivities have changed. She's actually eating different foods now. And we haven't even really started even detoxing the biotoxins out from that root canal. But, you know, I mean, so these guys shut things down. But today's topic is mold. And, you know, something, we're actually in Warren Phillips' house, who you all know. And something happened here the last uh, couple days. There's a big hole in the ceiling. There is a big hole in the ceiling. And actually, I would take you out there, but they're doing a little school activity out there. I'd take you out and actually show you the hole in the ceiling. But a minor amount of water fill leaked. And actually, it was just a crack in the ceiling, paint crack, they thought, that they were going to fix. And the gentleman fixing it said, no, this is moist. Very little, but it's moist. He put a moisture reader on it, and it was about 50%. But Warren immediately said what I would have said and you. Open it up, but he didn't just have and we, to open we it up. would appear to be just extreme, right? right. Like, why would you yeah. do that? It's just a little bit of water. No one would have, right? As a matter of fact, he thought Warren was like, what? You know, it's just a small amount of water. And right. Open it up, but no, this is when he thought Warren was very extreme. He said, no, 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 do not open it up now. We, you know, we'll bring someone, an expert in because they build around it a containment, if right. you will, right? Where they right. create something called negative air pressure. So when they open it up, Let's say there was mold, right? We didn't, we don't know at this point, but where there's water, there's mold typically. So when they open it up, it doesn't contaminate the that's entire. That's right. The spore, the biotoxins don't contaminate the iron. And believe me, many people even watching this, my clients make this mistake all the time. Number one, typically you get the aggressive person like myself, folks. I've done this myself. You've done it too, right? I gotta know. I have to know if there's mold there, and I go in. And of course, you know, I've, back then I would be sick for. For days, but um, you know, so mold. Look, it just takes water and some food. In a house, Phil, typically, what is the food? In a house. drywall. Drywall. What's on the back of drywall? Paper. 
Yeah, so that's typically the cellulose is the food and the paper, and it just feeds. You just add a little water. The mold spores are here, but then we add water. And then here's the thing, folks. We're not talking about mold allergies in this show. Please understand, this is biotoxic illness. The mold produces a biotoxin. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, because, because many people don't get that. Yeah, right? and, and when I do talk to people, they go, oh, well, I know someone else who's allergic to mold. I go, no, no, I'm yeah, not allergic yeah, to mold. Exactly, yeah. You have to go through the whole explanation. Yeah. You know, mold biotoxic illness, I probably should refer to it from this point on, is, is very serious. I mean, people with biotoxic illness get, I don't want to say more sick, but almost worse sick than someone with heavy metal you know, poisoning. Lime, very nasty. Mold has a certain fingerprint, has a certain look. And I'll tell you, when people get sick from this, their lives change. Matter of fact, I think the only thing that could do that justice, and one of the reasons I have you here, is you became a mold expert. From the fitness expert yes. to a mold expert. I remember the day... I didn't know that was my path. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know that exactly. fitness leads sure to But you know what? I mean, before we get into it, I just want to say it led me here. Yeah. So I think the Good. fact that you went through an illness, and I went through an illness, and we, we came together, um, it's going to serve all the people that we can help. Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt. Um, you know, our stories put us here. Our stories gave a greater, greater purpose. So, like you always say, we look forward, not back. Right. Right. You know, we're able to change the world, make a difference, affect so many people watching this. I promise you, there's many people watching this show that have symptoms. You know, whether it's can't sleep at night, sensitive to things they were never sensitive. Whether it's food, chemicals, perfumes. And I think one more frustration of becoming sick from mold or something like it is it's an invisible ailment. So people just tend to look at you and go, you're stressed. Yeah. We need a little Lexapro. Let, let's cool. just get you a little Xanax and you'll be okay. Well, you know, my illness, um, I, someone close to me said to me once, and I still remember, as you know, that was years ago, you know, just, just push through it. If I were you, I would just push through it. And you try that. Well, you do. You wake up in the I'm morning and you go, I'm not going to be sick. Yeah, today, so what he was right? telling me is I'm not tough enough. He's so tough he would have pushed through it. Sure. I'm telling you, I, I wanted to go across the room and do something dramatic. Let's just say that. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, this is a it's it's a, what I classify as an unexplainable illness. But, I mean, most people watching this have symptoms and they just don't know what's wrong, right? I mean, they, I promise you they've been addressing their thyroid like I did. They've been addressing their adrenals like I did. Um, which, you know, just kind of makes you a little better sometimes, sometimes worse. It's this nasty back and forth. What's going on? My hair is getting thinner. I'm gaining weight because that's one of the symptoms for mold um, is you lose muscle and gain fat. I mean, go figure. I became skinny fat. You lost muscle in your process. Tremendous. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a horrific hormonal experience that is not good. But I can tell you this. The answer isn't chasing hormones, taking more hormones. The answer, as I always say, find the cause. The problem with this is people don't know, right? I mean, there's four people living in a house often. Not only people don't know, one person people gets don't sick. want to hear. No. Right? Absolutely so if not. somebody goes, oh yeah, I found some mold behind my cabinet. They're coming in to clean it up. You go, no, get out of the house. Just get out of the house. Don't sleep there. Yeah. Right? Let's get the work. Let's get it tested. No, no, it's just a little bit it's of mold. Just a little bit of mold. Right. Yeah. It's only after they have the experience that suddenly their interest changes. They go, tell me about this. Yeah. You know, how can I get well? You know, actually what you said there is a, a great thing because, see, we think about that little mildew on the bathroom wall is the mold. And I've seen that my whole life. That's a, look, there's different types of mold. You know, there's many, obviously, types of mold. There's at least six that are nasty, nasty guys. Maybe one you're familiar with is black mold, stachybotrys, aspergillus, right? I mean, there's these nasty guys. Yeah, this is part of our education. Yeah, exactly. How do we know these <laughs> names? Because we, you know, we fear these guys, right? And these guys beat us up a little bit. And look, I want to say this too, and I want you to tell your story, but, you know, we both became sensitive to our world. You know, multi-chemically sensitive, MCS, I mean, where I was afraid to go outside of my space, my safe space. I was afraid well, to be let's around. Let's talk a little bit people. about the experience I went through, and then we'll come back and, and okay. talk about that. But, and let me just say this before we get there. I got there via heavy metals. You got there via mold. Mm -hmm. But we both landed in the same place. We were couldn't function in our world. Tell your story, because it's a unique one. There is one more piece of that. You were very functional. So people expect a lot of you. Perfect. So when function. you go through this, everybody's looking at you going, come on, just be yourself. Just do what you normally do. And that, that's a huge part of the frustration is people don't quite get it. Right. And you don't know how to explain it. And the harder you try to explain it, the crazier they start to think you are. I actually hid it 
from my family for years. Hit it. I just wasn't showing up at family functions. Mm -hmm. Number one, God forbid I take a cologne hit or you know, I would get sick and even the actual emotional stress of thinking about getting sick would make me sick. So, right. I mean, it was like, so I was, wasn't showing up and my family was really, you know, what's wrong? I remember the day I went where I was sitting, where my father was sitting and I told my dad and I just started crying, you know, and I'm, I, can't, I can't let myself go down this road, but I started crying. He said, what, what's wrong? And I said, dad, I've been sick. What do you mean? He couldn't understand that. I mean, number one, I hit it, right? So I'd come over and put the face on. They can't understand. And, and, you know, he just never got it. You know, my sister, my one sister never got it, you know? Because it's a little bit like, did you ever see those old movies where aliens land and they start to take over people's bodies, like mm -hmm. the invasion of the body snatchers, right? And there's always one person in the town who knows, and he tries to warn everybody. He goes, no, don't go home. Your wife is an alien. Yeah. And they go, shut up. And you become that, you know, the more that you try to kind of yeah. allow other people into that world, yeah. the more they think that you're in a different world, no, right? No, no doubt about it. And because I was the health guy in my family, there was a whole nother thing of embarrassment. There was a whole nother thing of like, it's just him being overboard once again, right? right? You start to feel like a hypocrite. Uh, no no because doubt. Because here you are advising people. Felt like a hypocrite. Yeah, I, yeah. You went through that too. I put Absolutely. that together differently, right? It's like hypocrite. Uh, just being overboard again about his health, right? I mean, so there's multiple reasons why I didn't want anyone to know. And I, I lived a life literally of seclusion and, you know, just embarrassment. But anyways, your story, you know, I remember the day I got the phone call, you know, of like, you know, someone referred you to me um, as a client. And I remember hearing your story and thinking, that's, that's a yet another amazing story, but yet that I hear all the time just, you know, differently. Right. But tell the story because I think it is the stories you know, that really capture people and get people to think. And let me start out by saying, I think before Hurricane Wilma, and I'll explain what she has mm -hmm. to do with it, before Hurricane Wilma, my life was as close to perfect as it gets. It really was. I would say the same about mine. And I don't know that I appreciated it then. I would you say know? the same about me. <laughs> Sometimes you have to lose something to yeah. realize how valuable it was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I really had an idealistic uh, life. I mean, I had a beautiful home yeah. and a beautiful wife and a beautiful little girl and a tremendous yeah. business and everything was working. I was traveling around the world doing seminars and appearances. And mm -hmm. Yeah, you're a famous guy. Life was really, really exciting yeah. and fun and just wonderful, you know. Um, and then there was a year, 2005, in South Florida where three major hurricanes hit. And my wife and... I guess one-year-old daughter at that time, um, stayed there with me through the first two. And we didn't have major damage, but it's an inconvenience. Yeah. Your power goes out for three or four days. You can't get food. You I know, guess you, you get to, used to it living down there. Well, you don't, especially when you have a baby, yeah, you know, yeah. because you don't, we're thinking she's crying and she's uncomfortable and the humidity and you don't have air conditioning. So anyway, when the third one was coming, humidity. when the third one was <laughs> coming, um, they went to Maryland. So I stayed to kind of take care of the house. And the third one was the big one. It was Hurricane Wilma. And it was like a freight train just going bam, outside the house, you know, for hours. Then you get into the eye of the storm and it quiets, you know, and you take yeah. a peek I've outside. I've never been in one. I, I, you never want to. Yeah. You never want to. And this was a real one. Like when I moved to Florida, they'd have these hurricane warnings and everybody would run to the grocery store and fight over the last container of right. water. Yeah. And the hurricane would never come. So you kind of go, oh, another yeah. stupid. People would have hurricane parties. But this one really woke people up is, you know, what the damage is and why the warnings are there. So anyway, the next day, the house was fine. I think we lost a tree and a roof tile. Mm -hmm. Nothing major. So I'm happy. You know, I call my wife and I go, hey, things are great. We held up okay. You know, I'm looking around the neighborhood and I see stop signs or, you know, in the lake. I mean, everything is blown everywhere, but our house was okay. So now I do what I would do, of course, is I go check on my office. And I go to my office, which in total was about 4,500 square feet. Half of it was warehouse space. So we were selling books and nutritional supplements and programs and DVDs. And, you know, that, that's the whole, thing. the whole thing. And I walk in, and there's no roof. No. Well, I guess that was quite shocking. <laughs> no roof. But here's the shocking part. That wasn't even the shocking part. I'm stunned because I'm standing in my building, and I'm seeing the sky. But every single paper was right where I left it. That's amazing. Nothing had moved. How is that even possible? I had radio Man, show equipment. How is that even equipment. possible? I didn't yeah. know. Somebody explained it to me afterwards. Yeah. And I guess what happened is okay. after the rains, a tornado came down the street. Uh -huh. So the rains came first, and then my roof left. 
right? Ah. So um, again, I feel like, oh, I am so lucky. Because imagine what could have happened, right? So we get one of those big blue tarps and we throw it up over the building. And the following day, there's a major tropical storm and the tarp washes in. And the water line was four feet from the floor. Four feet of water in my warehouse, in my building. So when I walked in the following day, I mean, I was in tears. Mm. You know, it was just, it was horrible because everything I had worked to build is suddenly ruined. And mm. I thought that was the bad part. I didn't realize that wasn't the bad part. Yeah. So I called my attorney because I didn't own the space. I was renting the space. And he said to me, Phil, get out of that building and never go back. I said, well, are you crazy? I mean, this is my business. This is my livelihood. For, him, for him to say that, he must have seen something before for him to say that. Because he who would say that? no longer takes mold cases yeah, because okay. they're too emotionally yeah. defeating. I, I believe so, yeah. I know that. Yeah. 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 So, you know, get out of that building. And I didn't listen. You know, and, and this is and, why... And most wouldn't. But most wouldn't, and this is why I hope that you know those people who you pointed to before, and you said, I know somebody's watching, watching yeah. I hope they're listening enough to get the aha and go, maybe this is not excessive, maybe this is not paranoid, maybe there's something real right. to this. Because I could have prevented the entire next phase of my life had I left the building. Yeah. But I was stubborn, and I was determined. I said, no, no, I'm going to fix it. We've got the landlord's insurance is going to cover it. So for the next few months... And keep in mind, South Florida is in disarray, so a lot of contractors are showing up from different parts of the country yeah. with their ladders and their trucks, and cash you're paying in. them cash, and yeah. So they'd come in, and they would tear out my rotting drywall, and they ripped out my carpet, and they started to just dismember my entire office, just leaving the framing. And I was in that building every day supervising this. Then they start to rebuild so now different contractors come in. These guys are professional. As a matter of fact, they're professional enough that they had masks, masks on. Yeah. yeah, smart. Yeah, the first group, they didn't. They were just, you know, let me tear out your drywall, give me money. But this group, they knew what they were doing, and they came with masks. Now, a part of my 4,500 square feet was a personal training studio, 1,200 square foot personal training studio. That's what I wanted fixed first mm -hmm. because I had trainers who worked for me, and I wanted them to generate revenue. Sure. Right? So let's fix this first, then we'll worry about the rest. So I'm in that building now as they're doing the work, bringing in new carpet, new drywall, new mirrors, everything with glue and paint. I'm in there working out, not just in the building, but now I'm like sucking in. Great. So the office looked incredible, yeah, better I, than ever. You thought you were being healthy. Yeah, was exactly. Side of that story, yeah. Right. It, the office looked fantastic. In fact, I was thankful. I was like, this is great. Mm -hmm. Everything is brand new. And then I started developing a cough, and it wasn't a little cough, and it wasn't like a cough I ever knew before. It would come, at, it would suddenly affect me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I was coughing all day, but in a moment I would start to cough, and it would knock me off my feet, literally. I mean, I was on the ground, couldn't stop coughing, and it felt like my lungs were going to just come out of my mouth. Um, and then after a while it would subside. And I started to feel like it happens when I'm in the office. So I thought maybe there's something in the office that's affecting me, right. but none of my other employees were sick. So this is where you start to yeah. become the detective. Right. You know, what could this be? So I started by going to a doctor who said, go see an allergist. You know, clearly you're allergic to something. So I went to an allergist, and they told me I'm allergic to cats and dust. I said, I don't think that's my problem. Yeah. I really don't. There are cats and dust my whole life. Yeah, I mean, now? if a thousand cats showed up in my office, I'd go, maybe this is it. If dusty <laughs> cats were there, I, but no, this clearly wasn't the answer. So he goes, you better go to a pulmonologist. Uh -huh. So that's where the odyssey began. Okay. Is from doctor to doctor to doctor. So I go I to the this pulmonologist story all the time. Oh yeah, yeah, all the time. The pulmonologist, very nice guy, mm -hmm. easily diagnoses me: emphysema. I laugh. Yeah, there must be a drug for that. That's good. That's there is good. a drug. All oh, right, great. So I said, yeah. listen, I don't have emphysema. Well, your testing is if you have emphysema. Mm -hmm. I said, but I was riding my bike 20 miles just a few weeks ago. People with emphysema don't do that. I don't have emphysema. Uh, there's a cause to emphysema. What are you doing with asbestos? Were you smoking cigarettes most of your life? Were you doing any of those things? No. Oh. Did he ever ask? No. Oh. Actually, you do fill out a questionnaire that I don't know that they ever even look at. No, no? of course not. No. Um, so he gives me two inhalers, and one was a steroid, a corticosteroid, and the other was albuterol. So I left his office, and as soon as I had one of those coughing attacks, I did the albuterol, and I said, I'm never doing this again, and I threw them both away. I mean, I just hated the way it made me right. feel. Of course. But most of all, I knew he was wrong. 
I knew it wasn't emphysema. I knew there was something else, but nobody could tell me what it was. So from doctor to doctor to doctor to doctor, on and on and on, and finally I wind up at a major medical institution that nobody's heard of. You're relating to most people watching this show right now. The doctor to doctor to doctor, wondering what's going on, trying different medications. Matter of fact, most of these people have tried just about every supplement out there. Well, you know what's the really market, what so. was kind of frustrating for me is at the time I was very um, present on South Florida television and I had a radio show. Mm -hmm. So the doctors knew me and they would befriend me. Yeah. And they would start to ask me fitness questions. And suddenly it's my buddy. And I would go, well, I'm coming to you as an expert. You know, can't you? They didn't have the answer. No. They really not. didn't have the answer. They only had what was in their box, right? So the pulmonologist looks at the lung box. By the way, that's why one of our goals is training doctors around the country to with the answer yeah, of yeah. how we got our lives back. You right. know, we, we went through it for a reason. You know, it's like there is most doctors don't know on both sides of the aisle, alternative and allopathic. They don't know. There is an answer. There is a way out. Go ahead. So I wind up in a major medical institution, and I'm in there for three days because at this point, oh, probably eight months post that first mm -hmm. cough, um, I have severe tremors. I, I'm sitting on my hands all the time because I, they're shaking all over the place. I could not pick up a glass off of a table. I would slowly take two hands because my hands would tremble. Sounds like a neurodegenerative disease. Yes. I couldn't speak. I stuttered. Now, my livelihood in part was speaking, mm -hmm. you know, and I had to cancel appearances. I canceled an appearance. I was supposed to be in Italy doing a presentation. Couldn't talk. Wow. I was also having trouble keeping my balance. Yeah. <clears throat> What's amazing to me when I think back is I didn't get depressed. I think most people do and most people would, but just knowing about the body's ability to heal, I just felt like I haven't found the right doctor right. yet. You know? So now I'm excited. Yeah. I'm at this institution. They're going to give me the answer. And I remember after the three days of evaluation and brain scans and MRIs. At, at this point, did you think about this building at all? No. I mean, no, okay. Go ahead. No. Um, I'm sitting across from the neurologist, the head of neurology. And he's looking at his computer, not even looking at me, and he's typing, and he goes, well, Phil, you have Parkinson's. Just like that. Well, Phil, you have Parkinson's. And I have to tell you, nothing ever stung me like that in my life. And then he looked at me almost surprised, because he must have seen the look on my face. Ah, uh, yeah. And he goes, oh, don't worry. You could have a good quality of life for many years. There are medications for that. That was his... That's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Is unbelievable. So that was a bad moment, and that was a bad day. And I'll tell you this. Well, emotionally... The only image that kept coming up in my mind is my daughter coming to feed her trembling dad sitting in a wheelchair drooling. Because that's when you think of Parkinson's, that's where it's going. Right? Yeah. And, and it broke my heart for a day. The following day, I woke up, and I just, I don't know where the thought came from, but I said, okay, one of two things. Either I'm going to find Michael J. Fox, I'm going to do everything I can to learn and to study and to raise money and to create awareness, or maybe the doctor was wrong. Pulmonologist was wrong. The allergist was wrong. Maybe the doctor. That's a, that's a, I have to say that though. I mean, for you to make that transition in a day, to I mean, they're going to make a difference, or maybe they're wrong. I mean, I mean, that, who does that? I mean, you're what I call a three percent right off the bat. You know, it's like I mean, most people would have just been like you know devastated. I mean, if not the rest of their life, um, satisfied with the diagnosis. Either way, devastated or satisfied. With and the by diagnosis. the way, ended if, up on medication. if I accepted the diagnosis, I'd be living my life on medication, believing no doubt. Have, and I'd yeah. have every symptom. Absolutely, and believe me, this happens. People come to me years on medications, and I'm looking at it going. I, I don't even think this is what you have, right? It's like because they're lumped into this category based on symptoms, you know, and it happens all the time. Neurotoxic illness is always lumped into something else, whether it's MS, depression. I, mean, I can go down the list. Chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. We like to label things, and then if we label it, now we can give a medication for it. And right. live happily that ever doctor after. gave me you an, an anti-tremor medication, of course. yeah, and he gave me a beta block, yeah. And of See, course, we, I never we, once we label it, now we can give you something. So, welcome to the medical model in this country. But, right. Oh, and by the way, anybody who's been through this will know this. I didn't know it beforehand, but every time you're given a prescription, there's a code attached. Mm. Your insurance report ah. records that code. Oh, nah. So, if you looked at my insurance report, I have Parkinson's. I mean, I have everything that they ever diagnosed me with. No, no what, what about I getting don't? insurance, though, today? I yeah. lost my insurance. I managed to get another policy. Uh -huh. But I did lose my did health you, insurance. You probably had to prove like crazy that this was a false diagnosis. I was never able to prove it. Wow. Another subject for another. Yeah, day. I mean, that wow. became a full-time I mean, job, yeah. and then finally, yeah. I just said, uh, you know, figure out another yeah. way. Anyways, go ahead, because there's so much more. 
So, um, Ian, continued to go on frustration, uh, question. I started to read voraciously. I would call every expert I knew and ask them who the experts are. Mm -hmm. And I really just kind of set out to understand what's going on. But in the meantime, life was really hard. Um, even, you know, I would miss my exit all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. you, we call it brain fog, brain fog yeah. but people expect you to perform the way you always did, and your yeah. brain just doesn't respond, no, 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 you know? Exactly, yeah. And then they think you, another weird thing is, I guess my face started to reflect frustration, because mm -hmm. if I'm trying to think and I can't think, um, I remember Curly from the Three Stooges said, I'm trying to think, but nothing's happening. Well, did you, you try know? this? I Not didn't try that. No, I needed yeah. somebody else. I oh. needed Mo. <laughs> <laughs> That's when people start going, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, and you want to say no, I'm not. But, but here's here's yeah. really, and I and I'll say this to anybody who knows somebody who's suffering with this, is people would go, oh, I don't want to bother him mm. because I guess the look of frustration, maybe anger, yeah, yeah. so they would distance, mm -hmm. you know. So you feel very isolated at that point. So you're right. trying to perform at a level that you're not capable, and you feel like nobody's throwing you a rope, you know. So that's a difficult part. And then I was invited to record a TV show, and I really didn't want to do it, but the truth is I needed the money, and I mm -hmm. thought, okay, let me get back to some kind of normalcy. So we went to Chicago for the shoot, and the shoot went okay, considering everything. And then after the shoot, they took me to a restaurant, and I whacked myself in the tooth and chipped my tooth with a wine glass we were toasting because I didn't have control. You know, as a, You're right, yeah. Um, and then I left there, and I went to the airport. By the by, the way, he, he had a neurological illness, right? You know, wasn't Parkinson's in, in the end, wasn't MS, wasn't a neuro. It was a curable one. That's right. It was neurotoxic immediated illness is really what it was. Same one I had, different start, but our stories end very similar. Uh -huh. Our stories haven't ended yet. Our stories are going to <laughs> yeah, start. That's right. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I wind up walking into a beam in the airport and knocking myself unconscious. So I open my eyes, there's a circle of people around me, I don't even know what happened. Mm. But this is kind of the odd way that things fall into place. So after that, they're offering to take me to um, you know, a hospital, I go, no, no, I'm okay, I'm okay, because I know the hospital won't help me. I've been there, you know, they don't understand what's wrong, they think you're crazy. So I said, no, no, just let me be, and I missed my flight. So I'm sitting now waiting for another flight, and I start talking to a woman, um, who tells me that her father is a doctor of Eastern and also of Western medicine. Mm -hmm. And she saw what happened, you know, mm -hmm. so we're talking a little bit about it. And I start to tell her what's going on. And she calls her father, who suggests that I get a book called Mold Warriors. <laughs> no, man. I read that book. So it scares I, the hell out of oh, yeah. book. So mm -hmm. I order the book, you know, FedEx overnight. And it's written by Dr. Richie Shoemaker and a Dr. Schaller. Mm -hmm. Now, Richie Shoemaker was in Maryland in a small Schaller's town. Schaller was in Florida. Schaller was in Florida yeah. directly across Alligator Alley from me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go see Schaller. And I'll just say it wasn't a good experience. Yeah. Um, you become a victim, and doctors who are not ethical have the ability to make money mm -hmm. at your expense. <clears throat> So I called Richie Shoemaker, I called his office, and I called at like 502, not intentionally, but his staff had just left, and he answered the phone. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dr. Shoemaker, I just have to ask you a question. If I come to you, will I get the same treatment I got from Dr. Schaller? And then we started talking, mm -hmm. and he asked me what the treatment was, and he said, no. If you come to me, we'll figure out what's going on, and we'll get you well. That was all I needed to hear. So I headed up to Pocomoke City, Maryland, and he put me through tests. And every single test, yeah. bless you, there every you measure of a biomarker, the visual contrast test, all of the things they do to get clues to stack them up to go, yes, you have mold toxicity. I had it. So, and you know Richie Schumacher. Can I just, for the benefit of them, because there's people out there going, how do I know, right? One of the fastest, easiest ways that we do, all the doctors that I train, 60 in total around the country, they all have a visual contrast sensitivity right. test. It's called a VCS test. It's literally a five-minute test that we look at contrast of vision. Look, these toxins, these biotoxins from mold, from Lyme, they affect nerves. Well, the one nerve we can test is the, the optic, optic nerve. nerve. Right, it's very sensitive. And you lose, we don't look at acuity, so we don't, we're not looking at how well you see. We're looking at contrast. Um, so that's one of the screening tools. And then there's some other blood work that we do. Um, that can also be an indicator. One is C4A, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, so you had the test done. I had the test done, and, and he said to you me, You don't have 
you don't Parkinson's. have Parkinson's. And I jumped off the table and Did I hugged him. Did you kiss him? him? I didn't kiss him. Yeah. I hugged him. And you know Dr. Shoemaker. Know. He's not yeah. a touchy-feely hugging yeah. kind of guy. Yeah. So he's yeah. standing there like, yeah. what are you doing? You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, Nobody's ever hugged me because I told them they have mold sickness. Yeah, I go, yeah. yeah, but you just told me I don't have Parkinson's. Yeah, exactly. You, know? you just yeah, put yeah. my life back on a good track. Uh, so um, I love Richie Shoemaker. I mean, I know yeah. many people find him difficult. Yeah, 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 exactly. I, yeah. I remember that I would moment. Love, I would love the guy that told me I didn't have Parkinson's. Yeah, it was the opposite of what I experienced with that neurologist, yeah. right? Suddenly somebody gave me a real answer. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the beautiful thing. He gave me a medication called cholestyramine, mm -hmm. which you're familiar with. Yep. It's an old cholesterol medication. Ten days later, I'm working out, I'm playing basketball, I'm riding my bike, I'm ready to book seminars again. Ten days because somebody accurately diagnosed it and had a treatment for it. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, and what the cholestyramine does, folks, is it literally, it doesn't even leave the gut. It's an old cholesterol medication that pulls the bile out of the body, which pulls cholesterol out of the body, which they don't even use it for that anymore. Um, but what it does is the in the bile are these biotoxins, right? So they're re released from the cell to the liver where they're bound up into bile. And by the way, this is the way most toxins, you know, what happens, right? In the bile, the bile is released, dropped into the gut to digest fat, but it brings with it the toxin. Right. But the problem is in the lower intestine, it's designed to reabsorb the bile so it doesn't have to recreate it and it brings the toxin back to the liver. It's called auto-intoxication. So the cholestyramine sits in there as a catcher's mitt and just pulls the biotoxin out of the body. So you don't and you know, the really biotoxin circling. is a living organism. That's right. So when a living organism moves into your body, it says, wow, this is a great place to live. Let's make babies, right? So it colonizes. And the mycotoxin, right? I mean, you know, the, the, some of the spore actually can do that, right? But these biotoxins are literally toxins produced by a living thing. Right. Yeah. Nasty stuff. Go ahead. You, you wanted to finish the story? So, um, well, there's a whole other part yeah, of the well, story. Well, I'm going to just fast forward. You became, okay, so feels better. I got well mm -hmm. until there you go. I went through a separation with my then wife mm -hmm. and moved into a new apartment. And it was probably the fourth or fifth day I was in the apartment because I just got all new furniture and I was actually very excited. And my now ex-wife and I had a great relationship. We just knew we shouldn't be together. Right. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter lived nine miles away, so I'd pick her up all the time. And probably fourth day. I come home in a very good mood. I open the door, and I was attacked by the shower curtain. Now, I know this is where I say people cra think I'm I just crazy. had a vision of Chris Farley, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I did you fall on your face? Door. I, I could have. I did that at the airport. Uh, and suddenly the smell of the shower curtain became so overwhelming that I, I know thought this I was going to pass out. I, I know this. Yeah. And I'm thinking, what's going on? Is my yeah. shower curtain on fire? Like, why would... So I run upstairs, and I can... I, I don't know how I knew what the smell was, but you know when you open a new shower curtain, yeah. and it has oh, that yeah. smell. It was so overwhelming. I held my breath. I got a plastic bag. I stuffed the shower curtain into the bag, and I threw it in the trash and put it in the garage. I just do, do you remember stand the, the Steve Martin movie when he, he thought it was the cans? Remember they were shooting at Steve Martin? The jerk. The jerk, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. And the cans. <laughs> he's like, it's these cans. He was right. getting rid of all the cans. So you thought, it's these shower curtains. Yeah. <laughs> these things are evil. Right. Yeah. The following funny. morning, I get up, and I go have some breakfast, and I open up the dishwasher, and the smell of the dishwasher detergent almost knocked me off my feet. So now you're getting rid of all dishwashers. We're going to say, it's these dishwashers and these shower curtains. Right, shower curtains and dishwashers <laughs> are my enemy. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. But then it, it became farther reaching, and then it would be perfumes and paints, and everywhere I went, you know, I would kind of sniff first. Is it safe to go in here? And I would say to other people, don't you smell that? And go, no. And some perfumes that smelled good to most people mm -hmm. smelled so horrible, I don't even have a way to describe to it. To this day. I do not, even though I'm not sensitive to it anymore, I, 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 if I smell it, I'm like, ah, yeah. I don't like it. All right. but so that became, was part of So you became sensitive to the world now all of a sudden. Yep. Certain aspects, you felt better, right? I didn't have Parkinson's, and I want to tell you, <laughs> that allowed me to always feel better. Right. Like, whatever I was dealing with, I would put it next to that, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd go, okay, well, I have a problem with shower curtains, yeah. but I don't have Parkinson's, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, great. You know, moved out of the moldy you know, situation, got the biotoxin out of the body. So R1, you, you know, got rid of your source. You know, weren't getting exposed anymore. We always say you have to get rid of your source and get the stuff out of your body. 
So you did that, but now you're walking around going, what is going on? And I'm Except also, where do I go? Right, because I go? it reached a point that I couldn't live in that apartment. Mm -hmm. So now it's the apartment. Now right. I realize it's the apartment that's yeah, yeah. bad. I'll move to a different one. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, you know this, and yeah, this yeah. is going to sound yeah, crazy, but bizarre. Mm -hmm. I have moved since then 13 times. Yeah. It's trying to find a safe environment. When we spoke on the phone the very first time, I said, Phil, nothing will work. I had just built a new house at that time. Yeah, and I said, nothing will work until you find a safe environment, meaning air quality, no well, massive yeah, exposure you know of toxins. Before I met you. I did find a safe environment because I moved and I moved again you felt and like I that. found a great yeah. place and my life came back in every way mm -hmm. and I might have even been at my best ever at that time uh -huh. because I was happy and could bring my daughter to my place and feel safe and lay on the couch and watch TV and mm -hmm. it just felt normal again. And then when things came back to normal and the money started coming in and my business was thriving I said I'm going to build a house now you know, and I'm going to be smart about it. I'm going to use non-VOC stuff, mm -hmm. but I was naive. I didn't mm -hmm. realize. So I built a beautiful home, moved in there with my mm -hmm. daughter, and I lived in there for four years. But they were four difficult years because mm -hmm. I was challenged. Yeah. Every single smell bothered me. So mm -hmm. I went through a process. I said, look, I built the house. I'm not going to move. I'm going to beat this thing. So I started paying people to help me figure out how to make the house safe. Mm -hmm. So I put in ultraviolet lights in the air conditioning unit. I baked the walls, which I was told to do, turn the temperature up to 108 degrees. I tried everything that was told to me as a solution for the house. So no longer am I working on me. Now I'm working on the house. Right. I got an air exchange unit. And the truth is, after four years, not one of them really made a difference. Right. I had 17 air purifiers in the house. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing, because you buy one and then it didn't do the job and yeah. people go, oh, well, that's because you need the one with 25 pounds of carbon, so then you buy that one, yeah. so you become a collector of air purifiers. Well, the house was just putting off too much. And then I met you and we had a few conversations mm -hmm. and then I remember you came down to Florida to speak at one of my events Yeah. and I said, Dr. Pop, when you come to Florida, I want you to come to my house because I want you to help me fix it, right? So you walked in the house, and I'm expecting you to go, oh, we just have to do this, and we have to do that. And do you remember what you said? Attic. You said there's attic air attic coming air. in. Yeah, but it's that smell. It's formaldehyde. It's from the wall. I said your house is And it's also the new house under smell. Like most pressure. people would go, oh, it smells like a new house, yeah. right? No, I said attic. This is, I said you can't live in here because it's that smell that when you go up in your attic, you smell. What does that mean? The house was being pos under positive pressure. So the walls, attic air, in-between air walls were coming into the space. Right. So we have to positively pressurize the house, which you tried. Couldn't get it done <clears throat> because it was just too much. The load pressure. was too great. The load was too great, yeah. So but uh, so you left the house. So I left the house. And, and 13 then, others. <laughs> I found a doctor who you know um, in Dallas who is renowned mm -hmm. as the multiple chemical sensitivity expert. Right. So like, here I go, this mm -hmm. is the expert. And naively, I would go in believing the expert will fix me, you know, mm -hmm. through this whole process. I mm -hmm. keep going, well, the next one will know. Mm -hmm. So now I go to this expert, and um, they have designated housing for the people who come there, and it's an old residence inn, but they gutted the whole place, right. and they made it what they call safe. And I remember I went to check in. It looks like a residence in, and I said, "Hey, Phil Kaplan, I'm checking in." Uh, and the girl looks and she goes, "Oh no!" And I go, "What's the matter?" She goes, "They made a mistake." I said, "What do you mean?" She goes, "They put you in Building Seven." <laughs> I said, "What's Building Seven? And she goes, "You don't want to go to Building Seven." <laughs> like, what is it? She goes, "That's where the sick people go." I go, "The patients of this doctor." Yeah. I go, I'm one of them. She goes, "No, you're not." <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, so I go her. to this building, and you see eyes peeking out through the windows. You know, they're checking out who is this person. Um, there was a woman who was giving me a bit of a tour, and she shows me there's a laundry room. and give me the rules. We can't use scented detergent. We can't use fabric softeners. And there's a man in there, and he's staring at me, backed up all the way into the corner. And I'm thinking, what? Did, what did, why am so I sending that off? It wasn't just your big physique. But it scary. was my cell phone. Mm -hmm. I was holding my cell phone. That's the first time I stepped into that subculture. That world, yeah. It's yes. a subculture, you know, and, and we're actually, we, we want to do a show on it. Yeah, you know, and, and these are people who have just retreated. Yeah. You know, they found a word that they live by, yeah. and that's avoidance. Yeah. Right? They're yeah. affected by chemicals. Well, it makes sense, world right? Is this makes me feel bad. Let me get away from all of that. Right. It doesn't work, however. 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think it perpetuates mm -hmm. the continued degeneration. Yeah. Because emotions play a huge part yeah, in that's this. That's right. Yeah, and it, that's kind of confusing. And I, I wish we had more time. You know, I, you know, if we can get to next week, we're talking about how to make a home safe, and you know, we're gonna have Warren Phillips, you know, on, but. Uh, maybe we should bring you back on, you know, I, just the lack of time. But, you know, I want you to say a little bit about that. The show that we want to do is really, you know, are, you know, these just crazy people, you know, who get sick, or are they sick people who become crazy? That's the question. Yeah, that is the question, right? But, you know, you and I really believe, because we were these people. We right? know. They are yeah. sick people. <clears throat> they were sick people who became crazy, because we dealt with it, too. I At one point, I kept asking my wife, am I just crazy? You know, because I knew I became crazy. I did. I, I knew it wasn't normal. Uh, and by the way, going through the process of getting well, yeah. there are many tiers. Yeah. It's multifactorial. One thing to do. Yeah. There is not a one thing yeah, to no, do. I, I really want to emphasize that. Yeah. Must you change the way you eat? Absolutely. Absolutely. Must you change your environment? Without Absolutely. question. Yeah. But you also have to change your neural wiring, which That's is an right. entire show in itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was a huge lesson for me. And I also think that my optimism, and I don't know if that is developed or mm -hmm. inherent, um, really both. kept both. me in the normal world because when I see these other people who have retreated. That's not working. And at first, as you would, I wanted to help them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go, no, but look at me. I'm functional. Yeah. I can go into the mall. You know, I know how you feel, but I can go into the mall. Yeah. They're afraid of light bulbs, right? You know, so, and they, yeah. they, I met one woman. She had all her teeth pulled out. Yeah, because the young woman, one root canal bad. Old. Let's get rid of all of them. Thirty-six right? yeah. years old. She yeah, has no sad. teeth. Yeah. Yeah. She's got a shaved head because she can't use any hair products, and you know, your heart breaks for these people. But I also realized I can't be around them. Yeah, no, no. because they yeah. suck you. Well, into you, that you world. pull you into that world. So let me give them some, you know, things because there's people out there going, "Gosh, well, you said, you know, what do you do?" You know, and I, I have to just give the analogy because part of this, this is not a psychological illness, but part of it is rewiring the nerve system, right? So, you know, we, here's the analogy I can give you that, to help make sense of this. If a lion walked in the room right now, what would happen to us? Our adrenaline would go up, our cortisol, fight or flight. the fight or flight. We would literally drive inflammation process in the body. Uh, although temporary, as long as the lion goes away, but, you know, when this happens again and again, you know, the body's just driving this chemical response that makes you feel sick, ultimately. It makes you not feel right. I mean, so the chemical, you know, we get this massive exposure, and the body drums up this reaction that neurologically, release this, release that, release this. It's protecting itself, just like the lion walking in. The problem is, the threat goes away. We get a sniff of a chemical, and it releases the same response. And it becomes habitual. And it becomes this habitual neurological thing that the body doesn't even rationally go through to say, okay, it's not dangerous. It's just fabric softener. Although fabric softener is very deadly, I believe, and no one should use it. But the body should go, okay, we can deal with this appropriately. We're not going to die. But it literally knows how it felt before. It knows that its bucket was full, can't deal with one more toxin, Phil or Dan, so I'm going to set up every defense mechanism. And I want to tell you how important overcoming that was for me. Yeah. Because you don't realize that. Yeah. Right? You yeah. smell the smell and you feel the fear and right. you don't realize that wiring in your brain is linking yeah. those up. And so you, you really do feel bad, you know? You do, but what you don't realize is you have the power to break that link. Sure. And when you break the link, the fear goes away and the fear response goes away yeah. and suddenly the chemical doesn't affect Release. you acutely. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah I, I always say, well, if you've got pet lions, eventually you go, oh, they're not eating me. You know? right, they're so, nice lions. Yeah, yeah, when those lions come in, you're like, it's a lion, but yet I'm not releasing the same chemicals. Well, you kind of have to do that with chemicals. They're nice lions. We got pretty... and, and again, here, here's the difference. I started the show by saying the three amigos, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the big boys, the three big boys, you know, the heavy metals, the mold, and the infections, whether it's Lyme disease, you know, these root canals, that these toxins are nasty. These guys are bad. I mean, the Bible talks about pestilence, <laughs> you know, and how the nasty there. It talks about mold in Leviticus 14 and how to get rid of it. In heavy metals, my gosh, mercury is considered, you know, the god of deception. I mean, these guys are nasty. We can't avoid every chemical, right? We can't avoid everything, all the fabrics. All Not in all the, the world we live in. Right. Type, you know, but these big guys are very overwhelming to your nervous system. They almost set up these nasty neurological patterns, right? Happened to you, happened to me differently. Let us you know, respond to every single drop of minute particle of chemical to where our nerve system reacted the same as if we're in a mold, as if it's a mercury poisoning. 
So yes, we have to get out of it. We have to put ourselves in a safe environment because we can't have chronic exposure, right? No chemical chronically is good. No stressor chronically is good. But we should be able to take the little stressors, sure. whether it's a chemical or whether it's like upset, get away from it. But chronic exposures, they set up these neurological pathways, right? We want our environment, our number one. Let's make our environment safe. But part of our number one, too, is getting the stuff out of the body. You said that the cholestyramine, when you took it for 10 days, actually did something, yes. right? Okay, let me, I just want to bring them to something that I do all the time. I talk about true cellular detox, and I hope you can see that. Let me get the right angle on that. Okay, that's the cell, right? So what we do is the five R's, we start to get these pathways in the cell right, and that's what the five R's does. Now what happens is it'll start to release these toxins, most of which end up in our downstream detox pathways, whether it's the, the kidney or whether it's the liver. So I just drew a really bad liver, but we're going to call that liver. I better That one's so bad, I better label it. Chopped liver. Okay. Or it could dump into the kidneys, which, you know, if I drew these little guys over here. Okay, so, you know, these are the pathways that from the cell to the downstream detox pathways. But let's just focus on the liver for a second because we talked about the bile, right? So in the liver, you make something called bile. What happens is the toxins bind up to this bile complex. And... Eventually, bile is used to digest fat, so I'm going to draw the intestines, or I'll say the gut, down here. From the gut, we know that it ultimately, hopefully, leaves our body. So these toxins are bound up in the liver to bile. Then they're eventually dumped with the bile to digest, obviously, and they end up in here. But here's the problem. They work their way through the intestines, and in the lower intestine, bile is meant to be reabsorbed back to, whoops, I almost went too far, back to the liver because it doesn't want to recreate it, so it brings it back to the liver. But what does it bring with the bile? The toxins. So these biotoxins, like the mold that he got exposed to, end up going from the gut back to the liver, back to the bile complex, back to the gut. This is called auto-intoxication. What did the cholestyramine do? It's a cholesterol medication. Actually, it's resin. It's actually a binding agent. That's it. It doesn't even leave the gut. Well, we put that down here as a catcher's mitt. Now, we use a natural product. We use something called Bind, B-I-N-D. Bind does the same thing as cholestyramine. It sits in here as a catcher's mitt. So when the toxins attached to the bile are dumped in the gut, they're caught by the catcher's mitt, so you don't auto-intoxicate. This is part of what I call true cellular detox, Phil. We have to get the cell working. Five R's helps us that. And then we use true binders. And in the case of heavy metals, we use different binders, right? Because most people, and I, you know I love to say this, you know, Corella, you know, it's the metal magnet, and cilantro, and all these 10-day, you know, cleanses, right. colon cleanses. All of those things are too far downstream. We use coffee enemas to help dump that oftentimes, but it's too far downstream. It's not up at the cell. You know, you can use different things to assist the kidneys, and even a colon cleanse that helps move things out of the colon. But ultimately... It starts at the cell. Got to get the cell well, get these toxins down and out, bind them so you don't reabsorb them. That's true cellular detox. By the way, this is the lesson that most doctors have never sat through. That's true. And that's why when you go to a doctor, they're not bad people, no. right? No. And they have good intentions, but they've worked in the model of let's diagnose and medicate. So whatever symptoms are screaming the loudest are the ones we want to suppress. And right. that's the way they approach it within their own system. So um, this is what people need, and not only the people yeah. watching, but no, the medical sure. field as well. Just no, that, it, you know, it works. That's what saved my life. But, you know, you said it right, though. It, it, it is a part of a true, you know, it's a step-by-step -step system. Make your environment safe. We have to true cellular detox, starting at the cellular level, get the stuff out of the body. And if it's different for heavy metals than biotoxins, so we have to know. I'm gonna say the a good history will thing. show what the cause is. If somebody were to ask me, why don't you ask me what's the most important thing I learned? What's the most important thing, Phil? I don't know. Yeah. No, that's a good question. <laughs> the most important thing is that you have to take ownership mm -hmm. of your power to get well. Okay. Because as long as you're expecting someone else to do it for you, mm -hmm. people will take from you. They will make money at your expense and you will not get well. Okay. But it's that willingness to say, once I learn, I'm going to do. Yeah. Because it's all up to me. Yeah. So first you need the education. But once you have the education, you've got to say, it's in your court. I can say this to you folks, especially as a, as a last thing. You don't need another treatment, you know, and I always say you don't need another doctor. You actually
you need someone who's been through this, understands true cellular detox for what you're going through, and coaches you through the process because you have to learn the process. You learn the process, Phil. You learn the process on how to make a home safe. You learn the process on how to test for mold. You learn the process of how to get it out of your body. You know, from the cell, you learn the process. You know, I tell my doctors this all the time. You have to teach and coach the patient the process that they need to do and continue to do to get their life back. You know, one more treatment is not the answer. One more supplement is not the answer. One more medication, definitely not the answer. There's a process. You get coached. You learn it. That's how we got our lives back. That's how you'll get your life back. So stay tuned next week because we're going to talk about how to make home safe. And if we can get Phil back on next week, I think it would Warren be great. Good. And Warren will be here too. Warren just stepped in. But, yes, yeah, so we're actually in Warren's home. But, yeah, we're going to do that show. And um, I think it's going to be a great show because we all learn how to make our environment safe, which is part of our number one. We learned this process of true cellular detox. You know what? So we're going to teach you what we learned to make your environment safe. And by the way, this show is for everybody, not even just the very sick, because a safe environment is the key to having health, and we have to get rid of those toxins in our life. So make sure you stay tuned. We'll see you then.